In this video, I'm going to talk about splinting orthopedic injuries in remote environments in the wilderness. We've talked about the differences between urban and wilderness medicine, key differences as being time, available resources, communications, and the environment itself. And three of those play a big role in splinting in the wilderness environment. Obviously, lack of resources is uh, a big part of our challenge. We're gonna only have the gear that's in our backpacks or the patient's backpacks or our fellow rescuers gear and maybe what we can scrounge up from the environment itself. But limited resources creates a big challenge. Certainly the environment itself creates a challenge. The patient is probably gonna to have to hobble out after being splinted or be carried out. But in either case, their injury is gonna get a lot of jostling. It's important that our splint is effective in what it does. And then the role of time, where we may be with them for hours or overnight, plays a big role in our splinting uh, considerations. We splint for two primary reasons. One is to create a supportive splint. This is when the patient has a, a, a functional, a usable injury, and we're trying to provide additional support so that they can get out under their own power. Certainly, if, if someone can get out under their own power rather than bringing in a dozen or more rescuers to carry them or a helicopter, it's preferable. We usually think of these usable uh, injuries as lower extremity, knee and ankle injuries. We'll check and see if they can bear weight, even if it's with some pain, but if it's bearable. And if it is, we'll try to provide some support. In the case of a knee, we want to allow some flexion, but to eliminate uh, some motion to prevent further injury and reduce pain so they can get out. In the case of an ankle, uh, we want to support the ankle, right? Sometimes we can just do that with something. Ace wrap doesn't provide a lot of support, but it might provide enough support to get the person out. Certainly, uh, using athletic tape to formally tape an ankle is uh, an excellent choice. There are a couple of challenges with taping an ankle. One is we usually have a limited amount of tape. So we often can't remove and reapply the athletic tape. The other is it's difficult to get the appropriate amount of tension on that athletic tape. As they walk out, their foot will usually swell, which increases the tension. It may become so painful you have to remove the tape. Conversely, the longer they're on the tape and the more they walk with it, the tape stretches and tension can reduce. So maintaining uh, that appropriate tension can be a challenge. In this video, we're going to primarily focus on immobilizing unstable joints or, uh, or injuries. Our goal here is to reduce almost all movement. By reducing movement, we reduce pain, right? The pain that would otherwise be caused by transportation. And we're trying to prevent further injury, right? Fractured bones, we don't want damaging bone to bone, as well as we don't want uh, bone damaging soft tissue. So reducing movement, reducing pain, and reducing further injury. I want to touch on a few key principles of splinting. One is the importance of having the limb, the body part, in a position of relative comfort, position of comfort. For example, it's usually much more comfortable to have an arm across someone's chest than it would be extended and locked at their side. Another important principle is that splint should be rigid. In an urban environment where you're close to definitive care, the splint's role isn't critical. If you're carrying a person out in a litter for hours, the uh, rigidity of a splint is critical. Another important consideration of a splint is padding, appropriate padding. We want to reduce hot spots, possibly from the splinting uh, material. We want to reduce circulatory compromise, um, provide comfort. It's not well known, but sometimes uh, just taking padding and compressing it can create its own rigidity. So just with soft material and something to compress it, you can create the rigidity and the comfort of padding. And hopefully we'll have a chance to look at that later in this video. Another consideration with padding is we don't want it bulky. A huge bulky splint can actually create more problems than it solves. Another key consideration is that splints should be adjustable. We want to be able to loosen it if the injury swells and it becomes too tight. Our splint may loosen and we'll want to tighten the splint. 
over prolonged periods of time. For example, if we're spending the night with this uh, patient, we may want to loosen the splint considerably while they sleep and there's much less motion going right on. If there's an underlying soft tissue injury, for example, an open fracture, we may want to remove the splint so we can check for signs of infection or change dressings on that. So importance of uh, adjustability uh, shouldn't be overlooked. Uh, CSM access is important. Circulation, sensation, and motor function access is important. A key principle of splinting is that we want to check CSM before we apply our splint and after we apply it. For example, you may have a patient who had a dislocated shoulder. You've successfully uh, reduced it. It's likely you will have some sensory deficit following that reduction, but you do want to recheck it again after you've splinted it to make sure that your splinting it didn't uh, cause a diff additional uh, deficit. So we always check CSM before and after, and then we want access so we can check it periodically throughout transport and our time with that patient. And our final principle is what we immobilize. In a joint injury, we want to stabilize long bone and long bone on either side. On a long bone injury, we want to stabilize joint and joint on either side. So I want to talk about some splinting materials we might have access to in the wilderness. The first I'm going to look at, it's, a, it's actually a commercial splint, so it seems slightly out of context in this talk. But uh, the, these SAM splints are super lightweight, and so it's not uncommon to find people put them in their uh, first aid kits. It's sort of an aluminum bendable metal with a thin amount of uh, padding. Uh, it has a couple of challenges. One is it's not uh, rigid just when it's in its flat state. You really need to get it on uh, two axes, axes. So even here it's not stiff, but if I create just a little bit of a V or a U shape to it, like that, it becomes very rigid. Well, we got a little buckle there, but it becomes uh, quite rigid. So it does require a little self-engineering to create the rigidity. And the other thing is it does require significant padding. This padding on it, this eighth of an inch, is not uh, significant. It's fairly small, and even though it does create rigidity, it's more appropriate for forearms, maybe an ankle. It's uh, not very effective at splinting larger body parts, limbs, like a knee. You can get a little support out of this for a knee, but that's kind of the uh, extent of it. So, Sam splint. Another, <laughs> seems kind of odd, but it's uh, something like a magazine or um, some, a fairly good stack of newspaper. It's as with the SAM, it doesn't have much support when it's just on one plane. But if you get it on uh, multiple planes, it becomes much stiffer. So rolled in a tube, this is freaking pretty darn stiff. So like for example, an arm rolled up. And really anything that gets on that, those multiple planes uh, gains rigidity. So something like uh, an Ensolite uh, pad, Sometimes you can find something like this in a backpack where you can actually extract a piece of padding. Uh, not much padding or not much rigidity, but if you uh, create it in a U shape, it becomes um, much stiffer. You can actually take plastic like from a Clorox type bottle, cut that out. Those roll up, pack really tight in your backpack, super lightweight and can create uh, great rigidity for things like uh, forms. Another uh, good splinting material you may or may not have in the wilderness, rescue teams sometimes carry this, is cardboard. These are actually, this is uh, a commercial, but it uh, folds up, and this is for uh, a forearm splint. Uh, and obviously you could just use any uh, piece of cardboard or something stiff like that. But it's good to see this stuff because you may encounter it on a rescue team. This is actually a commercial piece of cardboard by Cascade. And uh, you fold it in, latch these tabs on the end, tuck it in like that, and it's for a leg. 
And I realize this is commercial, but it will give you some ideas of like, ooh, anything that uh, folds up. And the wilderness context can really vary in what you have. So good to be um, familiar with those. Um, another is uh, inflatable air mattresses, right? They're pretty nifty in that uh, you, you can put them on and then inflate them and they create both their own compression and padding at the same time, something you'll frequently find in uh, the wilderness context. Something else to consider, it's an important uh, splinting material that we use all the time to provide rigidity, and that is it's your body itself, right? We'll look at that with arms with sling and swath, where the torso becomes the splint. Um, uh, finger and hand injuries, you can uh, buddy splint fingers together. Uh, legs can be buddy splinted together. So when we're thinking like, what do we have that can st immobilize this? Think often, think first possibly of using the patient's body part and you providing uh, padding. Other uh, helpful items are uh, ace bandage, which I didn't uh, put out here. If you uh, don't have an ace bandage, you can uh, take a t-shirt and scissors and do a spiral cut. And that's really helpful if it's stretchy material and you just spiral cut uh, clothing t-shirts or long johns to create your own uh, compression material. Uh, something people often don't think about but is safety pins. Uh, there's large safety pins. They are uh, very lightweight, right? Way, way next to nothing, but they're super helpful in securing clothing and, and splinting material. Hopefully we'll have a chance to look at some of the ways uh, safety pins can be used. Um, certainly lightweight uh, P-cord like this, this is like one mil, um, is super helpful in co providing compression and securing uh, splinting material, and certainly any other kind of time material that you have. Uh, uh, webbing or cord. Um, clothing, any kind of clothing, uh, puffy jackets, um, sleeping bags, shirt, clothes, socks, all of this stuff is super helpful. It is important when you put these on to think about any hard spots they have on them. So even something as simple as a zipper or a snap when you're using this padding, you just want to be aware of what that is that's touching their body. Uh, let's take a look at a few splints. So uh, here we have a sling on. This is appropriate for a lot of injuries, including uh, most upper extremity injuries. Certainly this is very appropriate for a clavicle, right? The most fractured uh, bone in the body. Some of the key principles here is with a clavicle, we wanna avoid having something over that injury. We want it to, this acts sort of as a hammock, right? Supporting the hand, yet it still gives me uh, CSM access so I can check his cap refill, make sure nothing has changed. We don't want this floppy elbow here. To create that little pouch, we took the cravat, found the triangle, and tied a little knot, and the knot's right behind there. This is the sling to uh, keep that elbow from flapping the chicken wing. We want to secure that elbow. We'll often see these put high, the swath, but we want to capture that elbow. So a nice wide swath right low down on the elbow like this. Get it wide. And then I'll tie a knot back here. On all of these, I tie a, like a bow or a half hitch so that it remains adjustable. Take a deep breath. Feel like that's compromising your breathing at all? Yeah, Ability nice. to breathe? Okay, good. Get this wide, hands secure. Great option for a clavicle injury. Here is another option for routing the sling with a clavicle. In this case, I took the front side of the triangular bandage, ran it underneath his armpit to prevent pressure on his clavicle. When you tie these, it's good to start with a hand up high, close to his ear, because they'll settle back down. And when it's done, we really want this hand kind of in this pledge of allegiance on his heart rather than dropping down. 
here's an example of slinging with almost no equipment. All we've used are two safety pins and the patient shirt. You can see that it kept his hand high. We still have CSM access to it, provided great support for his arm. It doesn't, however, do a very good job of trapping that elbow. One way we can create a swath for this is just by putting a jacket around the patient. Another way to support a extremity injury is with no gear is to put the patient's elbow into the sleeve area itself. This both traps the elbow and provides support. It's not as good as a sling and swath or even the a safety pin method, but in a bind it does provide some stability of that upper extremity. Here we've splinted a forearm injury using a SAM splint. A key part of supporting the forearm is ensuring that the wrist can't move. If you'll sort of do the motorcycle throttle movement, we're trying to reduce that by trapping the knuckles. If we take a look inside of here, you can see that I've gone around his knuckles. It's helpful if you create a little twist as you go between the web of the thumb to reduce the amount of material there and then trap those thumbs. You can see if I hadn't put trapped the knuckles, right, we get this flexion that's going to really cause a lot of pain. You can also see that we've put a roll, could be socks or something, doesn't need to be a medical supply, inside his hand and to trap. Here we've splinted another forearm injury. I'll take it apart to show some of the elements of it. You can see from starting that his hand is in a nice high position. We accomplished that by tying this splint on, or this uh, triangular bandage when his hand was held high, so when he settles down into it. We've got a wide sway to prevent that floppy elbow. My knots are easy to untie. You can see I've shown three different ways of running triangular bandages to sling an arm injury. The first one for the clavicle was sort of a hammock that wrapped around and encapsulated that arm and kept any pressure from being on top of the clavicle. On the second one, we took this front piece of the triangle bandage and ran it underneath his armpit, again, to prevent any pressure. Here we've routed the triangular bandage in a more traditional sling and swath manner going up on each side and you can see it does squeeze a little bit on his neck. It also creates more pressure on the back of his neck. So I did use a piece of closed cell foam back there to pad his neck. So we take that off. You can see I did have the knot in the end to create a pocket for his elbow. Here we've used a magazine. I'll take it apart and show you how it was assembled the part of my bow. To secure the ends of gauze, tucking it in really isn't adequate. It won't stay. So what I did is I created these two tails. I did that by cutting up the gauze or tearing it and then just tying a knot in it. It's a great way to secure gauze. As I unwrap this, we can see where how his hand is. Put the gauze inside again, had CSM access, and by encapsulating those knuckles, by trapping his knuckles, we're able to pr prevent that motorcycle throttle wrist. Uh, here's an example of what not to do. And in this case, well, there's a few problems. Probably the most notable is there's too much padding, right? That bulk. We try to fill voids, but avoid excessive bulk. All of this bulk pre prevents the arm from going into that Pledge of Allegiance position we want and gaining stability by using his body for rigidity. This also doesn't allow any CSM access, so we're not able to check his hand. This is a very small sleeping bag, and if applied appropriately with minimal padding between his arm and his body, we probably could use this to splint, provided we also allowed CSM access. Humorous splinting in the wilderness is really challenging. Remember, this is a big bone, so these are big MOI injuries. To splint a humerus, we usually use the body itself for our rigidity. 
So our goal is to fill this void, avoid the void. This varies a lot based on the anatomy. A thinner person like Andy requires more padding in there to provide support for that humerus. But uh, larger people, sometimes you need just a very small amount, like one shirt or something in between there to provide padding. So we look at that and think like, what's the appropriate size to fill that void so when we attach it to their body, it's not bending the point of fracture in their, in their humerus. You'll turn a little bit. Humerus fractures as well, we want to avoid upward pressure on the elbow as well as elbow injuries. So when we uh, swing, sling and swath these, we usually think about just applying a swath and avoiding the sling that would put upward pressure on the elbow. So here I've used compression bandages to create a swath to hold this humerus against that padding. He's getting the rigidity from his body. He's got CSM access and I've avoided any upward pressure on his elbow. Another example of using the body to gain rigidity through buddy splinting is a finger injury. There's a couple of things going on here. One is I've avoided having any tape against the skin, so I've used just a thin piece of gauze where the tape was going. And very important is to put some gauze uh, between the fingers so we don't have skin to skin going on there or damage the skin. So uh, pelvic injuries, pelvic fractures are up. Uh, real challenge in the wilderness environment, in part because it takes a significant MOI to fracture a pelvis, in part because it's a life threat, right? This is going to be a rapid evacuation. We've got a couple of options. If we don't have any commercial gear, a uh, sheet binder, putting a sheet around the patient and tightening it is an option. It pushes their pelvic together. There are also some good uh, commercial options. This is sort of a larger pelvic splint. It's a little impractical in the wilderness, but something you might want to be familiar with. SAM, the company that makes that small flexible splint, also makes this splint, this SAM pelvic splint. And uh, this is really sweet. It's been, uh, it has a spring-loaded catch in it, so it helps you apply the correct amount of pressure to know when you've pushed the pelvis together appropriately. Let's look at how this goes on. So using this SAM pelvic splint, we want to uh, get the SAM on the greater trochanter on the patient's hips. You can see it has these holes and a pin and a handhold. And so we want to uh, pull in both directions. And there's a moment when there's a little pop, and that means there's appropriate tension on the splint. And then we lower it down like that and secure the Velcro. It's an excellent tool if you have it. With any of these uh, pelvic fractures that we have to transport, we have to consider spinal precautions. If you only need to carry the patient a short distance, like to a helicopter, you may be able to use a blanket to carry the person with a little bit of trade-off on spinal immobilization. If you're gonna have to carry the patient out, one option is a backboard, but they're uncomfortable. The patient slides around on them. They just don't function very well in the wilderness, in the backcountry. A solid choice, although it may not be available, is a full body vacuum splint. It spreads the patient's weight out across the pad, so it reduces uh, press, pressure sores. It prevents the patient from sliding back and forth. It stabilizes the spine, um, and you can press it in and help control movement of the pelvic area. So femur fractures are challenging. It goes without saying. For a lot of the same reason pelvic fractures are, right? We've got a life threat. Um, we also have the challenges of how are we going to perform some type of spinal immobilization. For femur fractures, we really have three splinting options. We, uh, two of them involve traction. We can use a commercial traction splint. Might come in with a helicopter. 
Uh, there's a little traction splint, looks sort of like a, a avalanche probe or a ski pole. It's about this big, called a KTD, a Kendrick traction device with a single pole that you can use to apply traction. We can use a ski pole or a hiking stick and improvise a traction splint, or we can buddy splint the legs together. So we gain stability, rigidity from the patient's other leg, but it doesn't involve traction. The challenge with traction splints in the wild is once you begin moving, once you begin transporting the patient, you tend to lose the appropriate amount of traction. It's a challenge attaching it through their groin and getting the traction splint in the appropriate place. If you do get appropriate traction, then once they begin jiggling in a litter or during a carry, you almost always lose that traction. It also takes a long time to build a traction splint. So in our experience, traction splints are worth considering if the patient's gonna be in one place for a while. For example, if you're gonna be waiting for a few hours before a helicopter arrives, then building a traction splint, if it reduces pain for your patient, like by all means do it. But if you're gonna to have to do any transport, if you're gonna begin evacuation soon, or if you're not experienced in building a traction splint, we really recommend buddy splinting the legs together. Another consideration when you're building a traction splint is you need to create an ankle hitch, something that will secure on their foot where you're able to pull from basically the sole of their foot. It's challenging to build that ankle hitch such that it's secure enough to provide traction, yet it doesn't force the foot down or compromise the circulation in the foot. So something to think about. So here we have his legs buddy splinted together. This buddy splinting, using the body to create rigidity, is a common way of splinting a femur fracture, but it's also appropriate for some lower leg injuries. You can see that we've made these cravats really wide to distribute the force in a big area on his leg. We don't want like really thin lines without adding additional padding to the outside of this splint. It's important to dress your uh, splint a little bit. Just tuck in loose tails. It makes it easier to adjust to see if it's coming untied. Just kind of a clean appearance to it. In buddy splinting and all splinting, our goal is to avoid the void without creating unnecessary padding. So we've got a little additional padding up high in his thighs, a little less near his knees, but we wanna make sure there's adequate uh, padding between his knees so they're not creating a sore, and then a little more padding as we come down to his lower leg. We've also secured his feet, obviously wiggling feet, it creates tremendous pain for a femur fracture. We do have CSM access, we can ask if he feels it, he can wiggle his foot, and we can get access to arterial pulses. Uh, the decision about if you want to keep shoes on or shoes off is a bit of an environmental decision. Usually our general experience is that if the environment is conducive for it, it's better to have the shoes off, maybe just put on um, socks and comfortably pad the feet. We used these big cravats because they were available, but we could have used a pea cord, climbing cord, webbing, or other material to secure his legs together, provided we considered if there was a need for additional padding on the outside of his legs. So this splint is appropriate for either a knee injury or a lower leg injury. For a knee injury, it's stabilized long bone to long bone. For a long bone injury, it's stabilized joint to joint, one of those key principles we talked about early on. When we stabilize a lower extremity, it's important to reduce foot motion. It's very similar to wanting to re reduce wrist motion when we have an upper extremity motion. You can see how much uh, movement it would cause in the leg if his foot was to move. With the foot, we have the same issues as I sh showed during the buddy splinting, shoe on or shoe off. It's based on environmental conditions and how long the patient is gonna be in this. In this case, we've used webbing, something you are more likely to have, probably a sleeping pad and webbing in the backcountry. Each one of these knots, they're actually hitches, is independent of the others. 
So we can loosen or tighten this at any point along the system for adjustability. You can also see that the padding is protecting the patient from the webbing itself. We, uh, for padding, we also put some padding behind his knee. We don't want his leg to be fully extended. It's just not comfortable. So putting a few pair of socks, which is what we put under there, or a glove or something, just to keep a little bit of bend in that knee is much more comfortable for the patient. As far as these inflatable mattresses, uh, using them for a splint, uh, they're pretty sweet. They provide rigidity and padding at the same time. They avoid all the void by their inflation, and they're quite firm once uh, compressed down. A couple of considerations. One is you do want access to the valve. If you go down in elevation, these tend to get softer, and you'll either need to retie your uh, compression straps or add additional air. Another consideration, if you're going up in elevation, for example, flying a patient in a helicopter, these will become more rigid, stiffer. And so just something to be aware of as you go into the field. Here we have an example of stabilizing an ankle injury. We've stabilized his foot and his lower leg, lung bones on either side of that joint where the injury is. This one we've done using a different technique to gain rigidity. We didn't use the same splint or any external material. We didn't use the patient's body to gain rigidity. Instead, we did it just by compressing padding, by compressing soft material. Inside here, there is a fleece wrapped around his foot that's secured with a, a wrap, an ace bandage. Then we have two puffies on top of that. And then we have a lightweight sleeping bag on top of it. The trick to gaining rigidity through soft material, through padding, is to really crush it down and to avoid any bubbles, any blisters where it's popping out. We do so on the heel, but everywhere else we've tried to really compress it down firmly. And Andy, if you'll wiggle your foot a little bit, I mean, it gains a lot of rigidity just through the compression of that soft material. We have maintained access to his toes so we can check. Uh, CSMs. In this case, we did take off his shoe because we really don't want to provide that much compressive force on top of the shoe, which would push into his body. Uh, creating splints in the wild is, can be challenging. We've got the issues of limited resources, uh, challenging terrain environment that we'll have to travel over, extended time with the patient uh, where we may have to adjust the splint. Uh, we're going to have to improvise the materials that we use for this. Talked about some of those key concepts at the beginning, but we want to gain rigidity. This is really important where we're going to travel. We want it to be rigid. If his foot is flopping down around, if his wrist or his arm is, it's time to take apart our splint and rebuild it. It has to be rigid. We also want an appropriate amount of padding. We want padding to protect the patient from the splint itself. We want to um, make sure that there's not excessive padding that prevents us from putting the injured body part into an appropriate position. We want splints to be adjustable. We want them adjustable because the patient may have swelling. Uh, we want them to be adjustable because our splint may become loose and we need to tighten it up. We want it adjustable so we're able to uh, take it off or loosen it significantly, maybe at nighttime so they can sleep better. We may want to be able to take it off so that we can check an open wound for signs of infection or to uh, change a dressing that's on an open wound underneath there. And throughout all of these, we want to maintain access to CSMs, make sure that our splint isn't interfering with the patient's circulation sensation or motor function, or that to be aware of the injury is causing additional problems with uh, uh, CSMs. We want to make sure that we check those CSMs both before and after we splint the patient.